And I'm Mary. <laughs> I'm. I am Mary Jacobs, and I ran a saner on Kodiak Island for 30-something years, and mostly with an all-woman crew. My boat was named the Renaissance, and yeah, I sold it about 12 years ago, and. It fished, you know, we, it was a, I had it built, it was a 50-foot saner, it was a beautiful boat. It, um, um, it changed hands, went to another, it's the second, second person, and Dan Densmore fishes around the Renaissance, and he, and when I saw him last night, he said, you know, we see the Renaissance out there fishing, but, but nobody's as mean as you are. <laughs> And, and I, I thought that was a, that's a compliment. <laughs> so anyway, so this is, um, more of my bio is in my story, so I'll just go ahead and read. I dropped out of Berkeley in 1970, moved to Alaska and fished for eight years as deckhand and skiff man for my husband, John Finley. After our daughter Balika turned three, I wanted to go salmon fishing. John didn't, so I went without him. Three women friends, Vicki Vesey, Mary Rallier, and Jane Eisman joined me to fish on the tiny Invader, painted like a clinket war canoe. John happily stayed home at the Mush Bay homestead with our two children, Mary's two, and Vicki's son. I was soon to learn just how unprepared I was to face the reality of being Kodiak's first woman sane skipper. I, I still cringe to think of some of the things that happened that summer. The first time I set my net was a disaster when the cabin filled up with smoke when the boat's exhaust system blew out. I slunk home to make repairs. The next week, when I made my second set, I caught Floyd Anderson's set net at Broken Point. <laughs> we spent the day with our nets entangled and Floyd disgusted. Afterward, we, repair, we repaired my net and hydraulics. I felt like a screw up. Two sets into my career as a salmon skipper, both disasters. For this, I abandoned my kids. I'm a failure as a mother and a fisherman, I thought. I couldn't look my crew in their eyes. Before tangling up in Floyd's net, expectations of my success amongst the rest of the salmon fleet were undoubtedly low. After once, everyone heard about my screw up and I felt like the laughing stock of the fleet. The next opening patched up again, I approached Packer Spit where several saners were rafted together waiting turns. The boys club requested that we bake cinnamon rolls for them. I laughed off the request and found another place to fish. We finally caught our first salmon. I let out a huge breath. Jane and Mary laughed off our previous mishaps. Returning to Mush Bay for a weekend after our first successful opening, my three-year-old daughter clung to me. When I left, I tore myself away from her. I promised to return often. As I drove the boat back to our fishing spot, I couldn't stop thinking about her sad eyes beseeching me to stay home. I had no relatives and few friends on the fishing grounds. I was lonely and homesick and felt estranged from the rest of the fleet. However, I was determined and became obsessed with catching salmon. And in doing so, doing so I pushed my crew as John, my role model, had done to me. I bitched, I hurried, I nagged, I complained. I yelled at Mary, Scoochie the nip, the fish are running, we gotta get it back in the water. Do you have to make perfect diamonds every time? Mary scowled. Remember that net mending contest where I beat all the guys on B float, she said. I groaned and tapped my foot while she finished sewing. We worked the long summer days from daylight to dusk. On closure days, I searched for new places to fish. 
I explored the shorelines of Kodiak and of Fognac Islands, looking for jumpers and noting currents. I turned into the marine, I tuned into the marine forecast and determined where it would be safe to set the net. I noted tender reports so I knew where fish were showing up and I had the crew steer through the night to get there. The pressure to succeed brought out the worst in me. One time Vicky was sailing alongside the invader, towing her end of the net to close the circle around our catch. She gave us a dazzling Cheshire cat grin, pointed at the water, motioned that she had seen jumpers in our net. Stop smiling, I barked. I knew we had fish in our net and I feared complacency would cause us to lose them. Vicky laughed and continued to smile, even broader at me. I see that they're insubordination. <laughs> Mary caught Vicky's end of the net and secured it to our starboard side. While we hauled sane, I meditated on what drove me to tell her to stop smiling and realize that I was infected with John's paranoia and that other fishermen might notice our excitement and would move in on us. It was, it was little justification for attempting to deny Vicky a joyous moment. I was embarrassed at acting so bitchy. To make things worse, I was humiliated by radio gossip referring to us as dykes, hippies, lesbians. But for the most part, I kept my head down and worked while my, just like my Jewish mother had when she raised my sister and me on her own in Boston. I knew my reputation depended on my success. I wasn't going to brag about my catch numbers, even though I knew we were doing well. For the most part, I tried not to give a damn what the other fishermen thought of us. Midway through the summer, I wrapped up a boatload. When we got to the money bag, Mary, Jane, and I squatted at the edge of the rail, scooping brailers full of salmon into the puckered end of the net. Heaving in unison, we spilled the writhing silver fish against our rain gear clad legs and into the boat as the boat filled up. Thousands of wiggling pink and red salmon tickled our thighs, making us giggle with delight. At the tender that night, I noticed the skipper's look of dread when I climbed on his boat to sign my fish ticket. I asked his crew what was wrong. He thinks women are bad luck on boats, his young crewman said. How does he account for my boat load? I bragged. I was on a roll and didn't want to distract from our good fortune and return to Mush Bay. Unfortunately, that meant I failed to keep my promise to Balika and went a month without going home. I missed her, but dreaded tearing myself out of her arms after a day or two. I could tell when Vicki and Mary were thinking about their kids, their shoulders dropped as they quietly stared towards the horizon. Even when things were going well, the bitch and me often surfaced. I surveyed the crew's, the crew's grocery list and objected to buying meat when we had unlimited access to five types of salmon and halibut and crab bycatch. I complained about buying candy or coffee. I don't want to be tempted to eat candy, I said, and herb tea is better for us. You can go without caffeine if you want to, Mary responded, her blue eyes glinting, her sharp chin set in determination. I can't. No job is worth going without coffee, and furthermore, I'm sick of eating fish and rice. If you want me to work 24-hour days, I need greasy fried chicken or a juicy steak at least once a week. Okay, I answered. You can buy chicken tonight. I hope to appease Mary. A few days later, I was hand steering from the bridge while the crew slept. I wished I had an autopilot so I could point the boat towards our destination and get a piece of toast or a bowl of oatmeal, but I couldn't leave the bridge without the boat going in circles, so I steered with one hand and with the other dug around under my seat looking for something to eat. I was surprised to find a bag of butterscotch candies. <laughs> and and a bag of peanuts. I didn't want to eat those butterscotch candies, so uh, I threw them overboard. <laughs> As I did, I thought about and compared myself favor favorably with Ed Munkowitz. After all, he threw every dish on his boat overboard in a fit of rage because the dinner dishes weren't done. On his next trip, 
he bought his crew individual dog dishes and sharpied their names onto each. I'd never do something that obnoxious. <laughs> I kept staring, shelling, and eating peanuts, not giving the candy or who it belonged to a second thought. Later that day, Jane scrounged under my seat. Where's my candy? I threw them overboard, I said. Jane stared at me, an impending squall visible in her eyes. They're my favorite. My mom sent them. <laughs> my cheeks burned. I didn't know what to say. I knew I'd screwed up. She distanced herself from me as far as one can on a 29-foot boat, collapsing on the same pile and shivering like a landed halibut. I felt like shit. I'm sorry, I yelled, my squeaky voice grating on my own nerves like the squawking of a seagull. Vicky climbed out of the skiff and came up on the bridge. What happened, she asked. I confessed my transgression. Vicky shook her head. You've got to lighten up. You don't have to be an ass to catch fish. She could be blunt and honest. The rest of the day, we fished in silence. There was none of the friendly banter we had been accustomed to while we stacked the net. If we weren't imprisoned on a boat together, I might have walked in the woods, Jane might have played her piano or talked to her mother. We didn't have the means to reset our priorities or to shelve our pain, so we put our heads down and went through the motions. At the end of the day and after the fish were unloaded at the tender, we were in our bunks. The cabin was dimly illuminated by Mary's reading light. Jane was curled away from me in the bottom starboard bunk. Vicky was across from me in the skinny bunk, the foot of which was above the oil stove. Her sock-covered feet perfumed the cabin with foot odor and fish slime. No one was sleeping. There was tension in the air. I knew I had to make a sincere apology. I leaned over. Jane, I said. She turned towards me, and I looked into her sad eyes. I'm sorry, Jane. I shouldn't have tossed your candy. It's OK, Jane sighed. The silence hung over us, unbroken. I had to say more. I cleared my throat. I've been known to polish off a bag of candy at a sitting. Could you please keep them hidden from me? A quiet giggle came from Vicky's bunk, then from Mary's, then from all of us. The tension in the cabin was gone. After the incident with the candy, I struggled to reestablish harmony. It's my nature to be bitchy, but I bit my tongue more frequently. <laughs> Most days, we set the net, restacked it, and loaded our fish aboard as comrades. We shared cabin chores and prided ourselves in our efficiency. One night, we sat in the cabin together, eating my canned venison burritos. I've got to get over thinking I have to push you guys, I said. Even though John was often fair, he constantly urged us to go faster. He seemed to think he could prod us, his crew to work harder by calling us names. He even called me a dumb cunt. Vicky nodded. He really called you that, Jane exclaimed. Quite a few times, I said, even if it made me hurry, it always stung. I worked briefly for a guy who harassed and berated his crew, Vicky said. She started washing our plates in a pan of water on the oil stove. I hated it. It's so nice not to be the maid on a guy's boat. She stacked and rinsed the plates. They expect the women to do all the cooking and dishes. I love the way we share jobs. Uh-oh. Where's my la last page? And anyway. Huh? Oh, there it is. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no, this is not. This is bleak. OK. Uh, so anyway, I learned a lot. Let me, I, I can finish this up real quick. I learned a lot that first year. I learned you know, places not to fish. I learned things not to do. But most of all, I learned how to control the captain bitch in me. <laughs>